Good afternoon and welcome everyone. My name is Marissa and I will be your host and administrator today. Welcome to the Abernathy Group Family Office, August 2024, First Friday meeting. Today's presentation is titled, Alternatives, What's Next? Since this time of year is generally dedicated to vacation for many, we thought it might be a great time to look back on our recent history, review the events that got us here, and evaluate the intelligent alternatives available given the uncertainties which lie before us. Our prepared comments during this session will be recorded as other families who are unable to attend have asked for the recording. Our comments today will be approximately 20 minutes long, leaving us plenty of time to take questions from participants. If questions arise from the content of today's presentation, please either send the question along by typing your question into the chat box at the bottom of your screen, or write it down and raise your hand at the end of the prepared remarks by clicking on the icon at the bottom of the screen. You should see a button that says react or reactions. And if you click that button, there will be an option to raise your hand. I wanted to remind you that we really enjoy your questions and we will do our best to get to your questions at the end of the prepared comments. One final note, please remember to mute your device's microphone and stay on mute unless you have a question as background noise is audible and distracting. With that said, let me turn the presentation over to Matthew Daly and Stephen Abernathy, who will provide today's commentary. Welcome, everybody. I'm Stephen Abernathy, and this is the August 2024 meeting, first Friday meeting for the Abernathy Group family office members. As, as a side note, this is our 22nd monthly meeting, and all of the meetings are available on our YouTube channel and on our website. And, and as I'd mentioned last time, uh, if you have a chance and you haven't been to our website lately, please you know consider dropping by if, if time allows. And uh, it, it's a new website and there's a wealth of information on how to continue, um, continue to kind of learn or to or become an intelligent investor. You know, there's some estate planning ideas and a new section on how to reduce your retirement plan costs while improving your 401k plan for your employees. That's a, a new initiative we've been working on and uh, we, we, we worked on for about a year now and uh, it's quite productive. Anyway, um, in our last webinar, we discussed the difference between looking stupid and being stupid and, and our discussion involved the fact that avoiding the noise and following the signals will make you look stupid at times. And, and it really does. Um, it's uncomfortable when you watch others speculate on trendy, overpriced investment themes. It's uncomfortable when they take unintelligent risk by participating in markets, which make little sense and come out ahead. Um, and you know, it's uncomfortable while you remain conservatively diversified in, in, in what you believe to be solid investments, which pay significant dividends and have little to do with what the talking heads are screaming about day and night on television and in the press. Um, you know, they, they do their best to make it seem as if investing is a contest or a game. It's just, it's just uncomfortable to remain a staid, thoughtful, intelligent investor. So it really makes sense, or I guess what I was going to say is it really makes you feel stupid for not joining the fray. However, each of you know, and I just want to remind you that history is littered with the fragments of those speculators who think investing is a game. And they believe they can beat the market by listening to the current narratives and overpaying for their investments by investing in hype that's bolstered by um, at best an, uncent, uh, an uncertain future. And all, I guess our message to each of you and us is that we want to ensure that all the families we counsel are constantly reminded that intelligent investing at times looks stupid for not participating in the narrative du jour, yet looking stupid and being stupid are remarkably different. And by remaining invested in what we believe to be, or in, in 
um, a well-diversified portfolio of reasonably priced, dividend-paying, well-managed companies and growing your wealth intelligently over generations while sleeping well at night in the process may look stupid at times. Yet, as Warren Buffett would probably tell you, listening to noise and participating in the alternative, which are following signals, is the definition of being non-stupid. Um, I'm hoping that each of you will have little interest in being stupid, in the being stupid alternative, no matter how it makes you look. So today, we want to discuss some of the alternatives available to intelligent investors based on what signals are telling us while answering several of the questions we hear most often. I'm going to stop now and turn it over to Matt to talk, you know, to discuss the questions we're going to, we're going to talk about today and to make sure we stay on topic while leaving room for questions at the end of today's discussion. So Matt, take it away. Thank Thanks, Stephen. Um, today's environment is riddled with noise that accompanies uncertainty. At any instant, you may hear any number of narratives which seem topical today, yet in a week will be forgotten. It is our job to remind everyone that to continue to be successful, you must be able to cancel the noise, the information with little value on what's ahead, and focus your attention on the signals or the information that gives you an idea about the future, supported by reason and logic. The three topics we are going to discuss today are first, why is the stock market performing so well, despite the risks facing our economy, which are right in front of us? What are the real risks we should be spending our time preparing for? Next, the rate of inflation has decreased, yet we still have inflation. What are the implications of 3% inflation target versus a 2% inflation target? Capital markets are placing over 90% chance that interest rates are going to be cut in September. Is this a political rate cut or is it a cut because our economy needs this cut? And what happens if there is no rate cut? And finally, what are the indicators I should watch for that give me information about whether to increase or decrease my risk exposure? So let's jump in and uh, let's discuss through three main topics so we can have some time for some questions at the end uh, of the discussion. So first, why is the stock market up so much? And what are the risks which are most important for intelligent investors to remain aware of and be prepared for? So, Matt, uh, we knew about this question beforehand, and it's a good question. Um, it really is the one that that's most asked. I, I must admit, it's difficult to see the stock market move up the way it has over the last year or more and think. Um, and think that there's anything wrong with the market, with with the economy. You know, it's, it feels like the stock market. If you use that as your indicator, it is telling you that the that the that the economy is in great shape. I I have some information here that's going to, you know, potentially show you differently. But um, it's difficult. It's it's the difference between looking stupid and being stupid here. Maybe. However, um, the data tell us that. That, as I said earlier, that uh, the 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 economy may not be as strong as the market believes it is. So there's a there there's a change coming. You know, I know most people don't have time to devote to this kind of research, but but if they did have the time to really investigate and and, and go back over historical ups and downs over the economy and the capital markets, you're going to find that there are more times than you would think when the markets and the economy significantly diverge. And in most cases, the economy wins the tug of war. In our case today, the risks we face are the ones that we've been warning about for more than the last six months. Expectations for the stock market to increase earnings by more than 10 to 15% per year over the next five years plus um, are front and center. And, and we just don't believe that is the likely outcome. We've got tax increases coming on corporate America. Um, we've got deleveraging coming and interest rates are much higher than they used to be. So all of these things are negatives for the overall earnings of the stock market. And as we all know, earnings 
dictate valuation. And by the way, if we're wrong and the public companies making up the U.S. capital markets are able to grow earnings at over 10% per year for the next five plus years, then investors will have little or no return for those five years because the current prices, <laughs> they're already pricing in the expectations that the market is going to grow at 10% plus per year. You know, this is why we're so cautious on investors who are investing in companies without significant dividends, with, with no bifurcated income coming from their investments. It, it's, it's probably not going to be um, an intelligent uh, structure for you. Investors who are counting on appreciation of their investments to satisfy their goals are likely to be disappointed. In short, if your portfolio is counting on appreciation rather than on dividends and income, there's a very good chance for disappointment. And it's going to probably force you to suffer through some pretty volatile periods without any returns for the next couple of years. Okay, then what are now, the risks you what are the risks ahead. you believe intelligent investors should be aware of? And in, you know, incorporating into their risk analysis. Yeah, that's that's the that that really is the right question. So yeah, um, investors tend to you know recency bias. Uh, we we talked about last week, last month. Excuse me. And investors tend to remain focused on what's directly in front of them. The, you know. They they tend to focus on the risks most investors are trying to deal with, and those are the those are the risks within our American economy. For instance, interest rates. You know, are they going up or down? Inflation. Is it receding, or is it stalling? Um, is the U.S. going into a recession, or are we you know are we going to successfully slow our economy while avoiding recession? You know. Again, our budget deficit is close to 7% per year, and both parties are planning no changes. I mean, they're just planning on continuing to spend money that we don't have. You know, this is, you know, all of these, all of these variables are unsustainable, yet no one's planning to deal with it. The U.S., along with several other dominant developed countries, will have to embrace significant structural reforms in the future. And, and when I say this, what I mean is structural reforms require upfront pain before they before they have the ability to embrace any level of success. I question to all of the listeners is does the United States have the willpower to reduce our structural Reform, reforms or structural deficiencies, meaning, for instance, Social Security. Do we have the ability to endure the pain that will be caused by reducing Social Security? Um, how about medical or Medicare allowances? Um, do we have the ability to, to endure increased taxes or decreased services available to all citizens? You know, and while it's true, these first order questions are going to impact our investment returns over the near term. The variables which are more influential over the um, over the long term or maybe even the short term, they're probably going to be forgotten within the months to come. The risks we should be focusing on are the ones that keep me up at night. They are the geopolitical risks confronting our global economy. And, and let me put it in perspective for you. These risks, if they become reality, will change the world in a way that will leave us less, you know, leave a lasting impact on the way, on our way of life and our standard of living. So the political environment in the United States is sharply divided, just as one small, I think, geopolitical risk. And it, it, it is becoming violent. The U.S. political environment looks more like a third world country than at any time 
in recent history. And our next campaign, it's it's just getting started. <laughs> On the global front, we are living in an increasingly dangerous geopolitical environment. We have at least two hot wars, each of which has nuclear power. And while I'm not trying to be a sensationalist, at least one of the wars, if not both, have the ability to become nuclear or become a nuclear problem because of the fundamental hatred, which may only be quenched by a complete annihilation or eradication of the other side. This is very serious and no one I know outside of the Abernathy Group family office has diversified their investment portfolios to survive this kind of potential geopolitical conflagration. I mean, this could be really serious and no one um, just, maybe it's just unpleasant um, it's just an unpleasant variable to 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 face. You know, please keep in mind we're not saying this is going to happen. We're just reminding every person that there's a non-zero chance that these wars in Ukraine or in Armenia, or, you know, and most likely in Israel, are are like may become a much larger problem than they are today. And we've not even mentioned China and Taiwan in our commentary, which is, they're not significant today, but they could become more significant, much more significant in the future. So in summary, there's there's more short-term risks than are currently being priced into the stock and bond market, making current valuations largely unappealing. However, the longer-term risks are the sleeping bear we don't want to awaken. And every investor on this call that's not diversified to weather any of the long-term risks will be sorry if God forbid any of these risks or any of these wars escalate. Matt, you're you're much more um, educated on this than, than I am. Any Any additional words of wisdom here? Yeah, I think the risks that are kind of posed by each individual con each individual conflict are worthy of noting. Uh, all, each of them has their own implications for certain industries and supply chains, not to mention global security. Um, but I think the greater thing to watch for is kind of new alliances and, and you know, not to be dramatic, but a kind of new world order coming out of, a, you know, who, who knows, hopefully, these conflicts are wrapped, but if they last five or 10 years or more, Good it point. could kind of bifurcate the world. Um, and I mean, you can just get a little taste of that just with the news this week on the the, uh, the election in Venezuela. Uh, you see how quickly China, Iran, North Korea, and a handful of others jump in to acknowledge what everyone else in the world clearly sees as a sham election. And... Um, you know, that looks like a team forming to me, and uh, I don't think it's our team. Yeah. I, I, I can't find any positives in that, Matt, I, I tell you. And and I, I don't want to be a glass half-empty guy. I'm just saying these things are not good. One other thing worth noting is we don't know the, uh, you know, technological warfare that will, you know, has been developed over the last 10, 20 years that hasn't necessarily been used in a conflict yet and stuff that they're developing today has potentially, if not greater, but new risks to markets and industries that we just don't understand yet. Another good point. Yeah, I hadn't even thought of that. Really good. So I'll okay, move on to the well, next one? Yes. All right. The inflation rate seems to be coming down. And if it continues, it will be in the 2 to 3% range sooner rather than later. The market sees this as a consequence, and as a consequence, sorry, is expecting a reduction in interest rates by the U.S. Federal Reserve at the next meeting in September. Is this rate cut warranted, or is it a political rate? And secondarily, what happens if there is no rate? Well, we're, we're, we're 
we believe a rate cut is warranted. And we actually believe a rate cut was warranted um, yesterday, on, on Thursday this week, or Wednesday. Our, our reasoning for this rate cut may not be similar to the reasons most believe there should be a cut. We believe that when you compare the risk of inflation versus the risk of a recession. So inflation is the least of the two bad outcomes. The reason is that if we move into a recession, tax revenues decline by four to nine percent over over history. Sometimes it's worse than that, and sometimes it's a little bit better. And if tax revenues decrease, it's going to increase our already significant budget deficit to over 10%. While this will add a huge amount to our already intolerable U.S. sovereign debt load of $35 trillion, it will signal to the rest of the world that the U.S. is again acting as if it's a third world country. This would mean that we may start to lose our status as a global currency, just like, like you said, Matt, and uh, or it may signal that the rest of the world wants to lend you know, uh, wants to lend the United States money. It, if you're going to lend it to the United States, you're going to lend it at a higher rate. And this would be a game changer for the U.S. because the interest payments alone on our debt have be have already become our largest expense. So to, to kind of summarize or in short, our, our ability to spend money we don't have is going to come to an end if we don't start acting responsibly. If we cut rates and inflation reappears, it will be a negative. If inflation is a tax on the poor, which is a horrible situation, it will increase the likelihood of violence in the United States. However, a recession creates a hardship on the U.S. population as jobs are lost, and it increases our debt, and it decreases our ability to repay our debt because of the lack of tax revenues. Of the two outcomes, clearly the U.S. Federal Reserve is going to choose to cut rates and to deal with inflation down the line with lower rates. Matt, how do you how do you feel about that or, or weigh in on that if you want? I think you might be on mute. Sorry about that. I was. Uh, no, I think you're right. I think you're right about that. I think it'll be in. You know, it does seem like the only pathway forward. Although it'll be interesting to see how the public reacts. You know, because. Inflation is a little bit sneakier in terms of, you know, everybody understands tax cuts or tax increases. But, um, you know, we've had inflation for several years. Everybody's aware of it now. So more inflation, you know, like you said, I think, you know, there's risk for increased instability or violence or whatever negative things that, that come with a discontent population. But I, I, again, I do really think it's, it's the better of the two options. Matt, you, your attendant question was what happens if there is no rate cut in September? Mm -hmm. And I, I, I didn't answer. I didn't do a very good job of answering that. And I will tell you that if there is no rate cut in September, I think that the odds of us avoiding a soft landing or a no recession, they, they start to plummet. They start to move much, much lower. We're, we, I think that there's a very good chance we're in recession already. And I know that that's a very unpopular um, viewpoint. So I'm, I'm not going to bother people with it right now. But there's lots of reasons and rationale and data to support that. But well, we don't know. Um, I, but I will tell you that if there is no rate cut in September, I, I think that there may very well be a chance for a rate cut intermeeting, which is likely to be taken by the marketplace as an emergency or, you know, as, as the Fed is seeing something that the rest of the world isn't, 
and it will be taken incredibly negatively by the marketplace. So we've entered a period of high level volatility and it's unlikely to go away. Um, again, those investing for appreciation um, are likely to be uncomfortable moving forward. But go ahead, let's, let's move on though. Thanks. Agreed. All right, let's go on to the last topic for today, which is which are the best market indicators acting as signals as opposed to the many signals that tend to be noise because of their lack of predictability or substance? Yeah, so so just, I, I don't want to bore everyone to death, but this is a topic we've gone over several times and, and uh, I, I know it's going to sound a little bit redundant. However, the real signals which offer valuable information about what what um, what future lies ahead of us, they don't change very often. So it, it's hard to go back over these again and again and again. That said, there are many signals today that are giving us pieces of information, which gives us a feeling that we're headed for a recession if, as I said earlier, we're not already in one. The, the first is the most often related uh, topic. It, 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 it's always aimed at the jobs market. When jobs being offered start decreasing meaningfully, it's unlikely to be a good sign of a healthy economy. And, and it makes sense. When job creation is decreasing, it's a strong indicator that employment is weaker than you think. This chart clearly shows the first edge of the jobs market. It's, it's a chart showing jobs being created are significantly lower, and it's been slowing for way over six months. It's not a, it's not a foolproof signal, so this is not uh, one of the most reliable signals on the planet, but as you can see, their correlation to recessions over the past 40 years is pretty darn high. So it's one piece of a mosaic that leads us to picture to, to a picture that says the US economy may be less strong than the market believes. This chart clearly shows the next step in the early stages of the employment framework. It shows the actual rate of people being hired, new hires. As you can see, this chart has also been declining for more than six months. And again, I wanna point out that this chart is not a 100% indicator. It's just another piece of the puzzle, yet it's often a predictive piece and it should be taken um, pretty seriously. So let's take a moment and move on to one of the most reliable indicators, one each of you should always have an open ear to, as it's it really is incredibly reliable because it is causal. And when I, when I say causal, I mean it's an indicator that once invoked by the US Federal Reserve, it always, and I wanna repeat, it always slows the economy because banks slow or stop lending when the yield curve becomes inverted. Meaning when it costs more money to borrow money for the short term and lend it for the long term, lend it at lower rates for the long term, banks can't make money. They stop lending or they slow lending. So <laughs> as our US economy is built on borrowing money to grow, when banks stop lending, companies stop borrowing, and growth grinds to a halt. In over 80% of the instances, recession follows. This is what the yield curve is telling us today. It's been inverted for over two years, which is the long in longest inversion in history. And this may lead us to believe that the US Federal Reserve has orchestrated a soft landing where there will be no recession. 
we don't believe this is true. We believe we may already be in recession or will enter one soon because when you subtract the government deficit from spending and you get a GDP number. So you, you have GDP growing at one and a half or two percent and U.S. spending, deficit spending of six or seven percent. Just do the math. It, you know, without the spending from our good old Uncle Sam, we would be in a recession. So, as you know, GDP is a lagging indicator. So, we don't actually know we've been in a recession until six to nine months after the recession or after we've already entered a recession. And the, the anecdotal evidence about our U.S. economy seems to signal a weaker economy, which is good for inflation. That's a good sign. However, it's likely to be a bad indicator for those who are hoping to avoid a recession. And let me show you why those who believe it's important to avoid a recession believe this to be the most important U.S. economic risk. As I was saying just one slide ago, um, or said differently, differently, this really is the elephant in the room. It's our ever-growing U.S. debt load. Um, easy to see, we're at record, record levels of debt, which means we are at record levels of interest, interest expense on that debt, which means our U.S. government has less available money to spend on initiatives which may be able to help us grow and repay the debt. So <laughs> our interest expense now is at the point that we are borrowing money to pay our interest expense, not to pay our principal, to pay our expense. Without too much rhetoric here, this amount of debt is just clearly unsustainable. And if we can't grow out of it, we will be in trouble. No one can tell you when it will happen. But this amount of debt at some point in the economic cycle will create a problem so large that our society will truly become challenged. And with that said, um, let me let me stop being so downbeat um, and turn it back over to Matt for follow on topics on where he may see see things maybe a little bit differently. And or uh, Marissa, if there are any any questions, you'll be able to speak up. Matt. Yeah, I want to leave time for if there's any questions, but I, I will summarize a little bit and say, first of all, it, it, you do paint a little bit of a bleak picture, uh, but I think it's warranted. And I'm particularly concerned that government spending has propped up so many different things, um, you know, and, and their job from the job market to, you know, money in people's pockets, savings rates, although that's not looking good anymore either. Um, but I think generally speaking, it's it's just there's a lot of scary factors. And I think there's a lot of potential for, you know, somebody to throw a grenade in, in the burning house and and, and have an, a, an event globally or domestically that triggers, um, you know, a weakened foundation that can just, you know, cause a, a catastrophic event or just too much risk out there. and. And then we're also borrowing the money to pay for it all, um, which is concerning in and of itself. Yeah. As you, and, and neither party has any plan to stop borrowing money. It, it's, it's, no. it's actually kind of, if it weren't true, it would be a little bit hilarious. It, it's just, and, and anyway, so I'm, I, I, it's hard to paint a, a good picture on this, and and um, everyone needs to make to make sure that they're well diversified. To take, you know, being diversified means that you're always going to have to say you're sorry, because there are going to be investments in your portfolio that are are not your favorites. They're 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 there because you're going to be wrong about some of the foresight that you have. And um, 
because we're human and we are wrong about our foresight from time to time, or, or maybe more often than we even think, we need to be diversified. So I just want to make sure that everyone pays attention to this and has some safety in their portfolio, has some things that will do well if geopolitical events go south with um, has some investments in their portfolio if our current U.S. Polit political situation goes south. Um, and that's all. Marissa, uh, any, yeah. any follow-on questions? Yeah, I do have some questions for you guys um, submitted from participants. One says, has any principal on the national debt been paid down? I thought that was the purpose of raising interest rates. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I think the, uh, the the purpose of of raising interest rates has was to slow inflation, to slow our economy, which, as a domino effect, will slow inflation. That was what we were trying to do: is to is to raise interest rates. Don't forget when we raise interest rates. We're raising our outflow. So we're paying more on our interest than we were before. The, the, the goal of the Federal Reserve in the future is going to be to lower interest rates as fast as they can to as low as they can. Because when we raise new money, when we go out and sell bonds to the public, we'll be able to sell it at the lower interest rates if the public will take it. My fear comes for the day that the public says, no mas, we don't want any more of your debt. Or we'll take some of your debt, but we'll take it at 8% interest payments or 9% or 10% interest payments. It's, it's, it happened in the UK about a year ago, and they weren't even in such dire shape as we are. So it's a very real possibility. It, it, this is not this is not a zero possibility either. Um, so so the bottom line, or I, I guess the the answer to your question is, um, not only have we not paid any of our principal back, we have increased our outstanding principal and continue to increase it by a little bit less than two trillion per year. What else? Thank you. And, um, yeah, next question. Uh, why are no politicians talking about the national debt? I think you're going to have to ask the politicians that. I, I don't have an answer for this. I, I rack my brain on it every day. I think it is, if it's not the first most important question that I would ask these politicians, I it, it's got to be the second or third. And I, I, I I think it's actually, I don't think it's the third rail of politics, meaning it's it's not the it's it's not the topic that will throw you out of office. But no one that's a politician wants to talk about cutting back. Look, here's here's the situation that we have right now. And and this is I'm not being dire, I'm just being I'm just being formulaic. Either we reduce our spending, which means less Medicare spending, less Social Security spending, um, less deficit spending, which means putting our country into a recession for almost certain, or we continue borrowing money at rates that uh, we're controlling now um, because we, we still have control over our Fed funds rate, but at some point we won't. The bond vigilantes will come back. The market will say, no mas. They, they, they truly will. I, I'm not making this up. So I, I, I don't know the answer to the question about why politicians aren't answering it. Matt, you and I d talk about this more often than not, and you have better, I think you have a better feel for this than I do. Can you just grab a comment in there on, on why politicians aren't talking about the budget deficit? I think, honestly, it's, it may not be a, a 
a good answer or one you want to hear, but I think it's just because no one else has and nobody wants to be the first one to do it. They're incentive they're, they would have to be incentivized to do so. And right now the public isn't demanding that they do that. Nobody seems to care. Um, we don't point. hear anybody talking about it on the news uh, or very rarely at least. So until there's, you know, politicians don't do anything unless there's pressure to do so, or if somebody's paying them to do so typically. So I don't see any reason why somebody, you know, it's, it's not really a, an area of conflict, uh, a co conflict of interest with business, I guess. Um, but I, th I think public pressure would have to be applied. And I don't see how that would happen. Although I'm sure there's, if, unless it gets so bad that, you know, people start demanding that somebody pays attention to it. Unfortunately, I just don't think it's, unless enough people care, enough people demand change, or some catastrophic event happens that draws attention to it, I don't foresee anybody bringing it up. Unless it's, you know, I'm sure there's other scenarios where it could be politically advantageous if, you know, if they want to make it an issue because they're about to lose their Senate seat or something like that, it could enter the arena of, of discussed topics. Um, yeah, I just I don't see it happening in the near future, at least not in this cycle. That's a good that's a good answer. That's a better answer than mine. Thanks, Matt. Mm -hmm. Marissa, anything further? No, that was everything. Those are, by the way, thank you guys. Those are those are really good questions. Um, I, I hadn't thought of either one of them. So please just let me take a moment and thank each of you for tuning in and and Please know that we invite you to either call us with questions or send them along as, I don't know, as we, we want to be, we want you to be as armed with reliable data, which will allow you to make intelligent decisions as possible. And um, with that said, let me wish each of you the rest of the summer. We'll see you again in September. Onward and upward. <laughs>